Okay, so yeah, I'm Susie, I'm the coordinator of the CSA Network UK. Uh, we are the only organisation dedicated to supporting and promoting CSA in the UK and we were established in 2013 and we came out of a the Soil Association, which is one of the organic certifiers in the UK, got some funding to work with some of the existing CSAs. It was around 2009 um, on how to promote CSA. And out of that came a desire from those CSAs for an independent network, which is kind of how we came about. So we're a multi-stakeholder co-op for CSA farms. Um, as well as organizations and individuals who support them. So our CSA farms are kind of official voting members. Um, organizations and individuals can join um, to support the work we do, but they don't get to vote. So they don't get to decide on the charter or on kind of the, any kind of core decisions we make about the work of the organization. Um, and we have a, a board of directors, most of whom are involved in a CSA themselves, some of whom aren't, who've currently got 11 directors and um, who meet monthly and kind of guide the work of the, the paid staff team. Um, we've got over 170 farm members, uh, which we think represents about 50,000 people eating from CSA. Um, and we were, we had seen growth even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. But over since, I mean, in March 2020, we had 89 members and yeah, we've now got over 170. So it's, it's really grown. And we know anecdotally that lots of CSAs who were probably planning to start in 2021 actually started in 2020 because there was such huge demand or CSAs that were only going to do 10 shares as a kind of first year ended up doing 40 or 50. Um, I don't know what happened in other, in other countries, but in the UK, a lot of the what well, what happened in some places was because CSAs can't really couldn't really expand production because they were already growing for a known number of people, um, but there were often market gardens down the road that had lost their um, like their supply into restaurants because restaurants shut because of COVID. So some of that produce ended up going into the CSAs and then going out as extra shares to people to sort of meet the rise the the, the rising demand. Um, our mission is to support and promote CSA farms to flourish across the country and work towards a fair, sustainable and resilient food system. And our vision is a thriving CSA in every neighbourhood across the UK, which I have yet to work out, but I think is between probably a two to five thousand CSAs. Um, it depends how how close they are together. I think that was working on. I was trying to work one out on having a CSA every 20 miles mm. or 20, at 20 mile centres, but it's quite difficult because you'd have more in urban areas. If anyone has a piece of software that does that, that would be amazing. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, well, our work, so we provide a network to facilitate communication and cooperation. Um, we support new and existing free CSAs. There's probably, I guess, the biggest chunk of what we do. Um, so we, we create resources like case studies. We've got an A to Z of how to set up a CSA, which we're sort of currently renewing, rewriting. We run some training. Um, we, we, do, we do a sort of masterclass series of six, uh, webinars on different aspects of starting a CSA. We are going to do some face-to-face -face training next year. We've got two CSAs in our network who do training themselves. So we tend with the face-to-face -face stuff to sort of support our CSAs to do training rather than doing it ourselves, although we do do bits. Um, and we do mentoring. So we, we bring people together in events. So we do regional CSA events and some national stuff. Uh, so our AGM the year before COVID was was face to face and was a weekend event. Um, we try and do a regional event in every region every year, although that's been a bit difficult with COVID. Um, and then we do mentoring. So we do uh, our standard mentoring offer is a day of mentoring, it's 25 pounds for the member and they get a day with an experienced CSA mentor. And um, usually they visit that CSA and walk around the farm and then sort of sit down and discuss whatever it is that they want support with. Uh, we are also trialing an incubator scheme at the moment. So we're trialing it nationally and also in a, in a county in the UK. Um, and that's giving a sort of more support over 18 months to two years. So kind of being in touch with a startup CSA for, for that period of time while they get going. Um, but it's very much up to the individual farms how they spend, as it were, their mentoring. So it might be that they have a 
an hour check-in every two weeks so it might be that they it's about eight days where but they can spend it in different ways and then there's kind of webinars and meetings alongside that um we promote and raise awareness and understanding of csa um, so we we did um we were two staff we were the coordinator and myself as um i was when i started was kind of funding and communications um the coordinator left in august 20 and we made a decision that actually two of the areas that we were quite we felt quite weak on and our members seemed to want was raised awareness amongst kind of the public and also policy work so we've actually we're now three of us so we've got we're all part-time but we've got a policy lead and a communications lead and they do do kind of general administrative and management stuff as well but um it's really upped our capacity in terms of getting the message out both in policy terms and in communications terms so it's felt like a it's felt like a good step doing that um and then we lastly communicate with urgency and kind of provide a link to urgency and i think that's it so yeah um i guess uh sam you're asking kind of vision for the future i guess i mean we are so i mean some of the stuff that came out of the network meeting we're interested in how we keep Defining CSA in a world where interest in direct sales models and local food is increasing. So how do we kind of maintain the space for CSA at the same time as making it competitive enough against people coming in? I mean, I think there's, we don't really have an answer, but at the moment we're going with trust and actually what came out of that webinar, I think was really interesting that it's the trust and connection that makes CSA what it is. And actually if we just stand our ground and and go with that we'll be fine and I, that, one of our csas did say in a recent we do an annual survey with our members and he said that we, we've been asking what's the what's the thing you wish you'd known at the beginning so he's 11 years in now and he said i wish i'd known that i could trust that numbers would go up so every year i panicked that we didn't have enough members or weren't going to have enough members the year after but actually we always have so it's just keeping going and keeping talking and keeping being enthusiastic um i guess yeah land land access in the uk is i mean the uk as you probably know is the kind of new investment bank for the world people buy lands and then get really rich not paying any tax to the uk uh, and offshore yeah there anyway so <laughs> <laughs> supporting what finding ways to make land accessible or to buy land communally to put land into community ownership there are other organizations with much more kind of experience in that area but I guess it's something that we feel like we need to look at because that is one of the biggest barriers to CSA starting is just lack of land or lack of access to land lack of access to suitable land lack of access to accommodation anywhere near the land etc and then I guess the other thing that um is food access so again like there's massive inequality in the UK CSA both growers farmers and members are largely relatively well off and white so if we if our vision is a csa in every neighborhood we've got to find ways of making csa food accessible at the same time as maintaining a viable income for farmers and making the businesses work so again it's a really hard question but um we're, we're seeing more urban csas we've sort of traditionally been quite rural um but we've had quite a few recently start in urban areas and i think inevitably i'm not that, that i mean there's definitely there's obviously poverty in rural areas as well but yeah, it's. It, it, I suppose urban CSAs tend to be have closer, larger populations of people with less money. So a lot of them are coming with kind of questions and ideas for how to make CSA work in those kind of areas. So that's yeah, that's another bit of work we are really keen to kind of explore and yeah, and learn also from some of the models internationally like stuff in Germany and the US on solidarity. But I mean, yeah, really interesting hearing um, from Morocco in that webinar. So yeah, I guess there are lots of different models. So that kind of sharing, I think, would, would really help. And then, yeah, I guess just general awareness raising of, I mean, we've, we've sort of adopted the slogan, CSA works for people, planet and producer. And I guess have really been pushing CSA as, an answer to our times. I mean, we're faced with massive inequality. We're faced with um, climate change, and yeah, 
kind of climate catastrophe and the need for income sort of viable incomes and livelihoods so it, it and, and strong communities so it feels like csa really does is a farming model that meets all three of those needs um mm. yeah i'll shut up now <laughs> <laughs> that's great thank you um i think that um i mean it's, it's actually quite inspiring and impressive to to hear about the the trajectory of the uk csa network since only 2013, is that right? 2013? Yeah. Um, and I have, I mean, I'll open it up to everyone in just a moment, but I just have a quick question. It sort of relates to something that we've actually already spoken about uh, a while back, which is mentorship, because it's a question that urgency is really grappling with at the moment um, inside broadly, just in terms of our um, strategic priorities, but also in terms of specific projects that we're working on and figuring out a way both for urgency to uh, be actively and effectively and meaningfully involved in mentorship, um, whether that's supporting national networks or whether that's developing our own mentorship program. And we spoke a little bit about this, but, I'm, but I think it's the first I'm hearing actually of this kind of pilot incubator program that you are establishing. And I was wondering if um, you could talk a little bit about that um, the, um, I, was, I, was, I think I was more interested in kind of the evolution of your mentoring system because it seems like you moved from kind of a more informal, maybe farmer to farmer exchange to maybe more of a formalized system than ultimately arriving where you are now, which is um, this incubator program. So maybe could you speak a little bit more about that and kind of what influenced or informed the decision to to start this pilot program? And if you have any sort of feedback from it yet yeah i mean um it came out of a kind of recognition that so i suppose we got to a point where we suddenly had a few established csas and then we had we hadn't for a while i mean our network kind of nearly ground to a halt around 2016 17 we ran out of money almost um and had one staff member and then got some funding which is when i joined um and then I guess did gradually see a sort of pickup in membership, although not for a, not for the first. So that was kind of nineteen twenty, and I guess realised that yeah, established yes. Yeah, so we started doing the winter survey, so we talked to sort of around forty of our members every year. It was, takes quite a long time, but it feels really worth it. Established CSAs yeah, so need really different stuff for mentoring. I mean that it tends to be around diversification. It tends to be stuff that would be someone very specific and can be done in a day. And then some of the starter CSAs are coming, they're people coming out of, they've done growing training, they, they know all the sort of agronomy bits they've got completely down, but they need some help with the sort of me mechanics of CSA, the membership side. And sometimes that can be done in a day, a visit to a really good CSA and somebody. But then when we had people who had less growing experience or people who sort of yeah, sometimes it felt like there were people coming in as well who just needed a bit more support. They weren't able to get that from a day. And I guess we were we we were looking at how can we make sure that new CSAs make it, basically, that they don't kind of, yeah. So we kind of asked, as we asked our membership, would this be a good idea? What do you think we should put in it? And out of that, I, I mean, one of the interesting things, the Welsh... So there's been some money in Wales from the Welsh government. The Welsh government's quite keen on small scale um, agroecology in general. And so a couple of, a while back now, maybe five years, they put some money in which helped, which funded a CSA mentoring scheme. And I think that was 12 days across a year. And the feedback from the person that ran that was actually that was too much. The CSAs weren't managing to kind of spend 12 days in a year it was just too too much time off the farm so we've gone for we've we went for eight days um which could be sort of it's actually eight lots of a sum and it's the same sum to pay a mentor for a day as it is to sort of it's an averaged out travel costs so basically people could visit three csas and have all their travel costs covered and then have two extra days of mentoring or they could have eight days of mentoring they've kind of got eight units and they can spend them on travel or on a mentor. I don't know if I'm making much sense, but they can also divide that. 
those eight days into chunks. So for instance, one farm, um, they've got a grower as their head grower who's not been head grower before. So they've chosen to spend two of their eight days on sessions with their board who are voluntary on finance and on membership, I think. But then the other six days they've chopped into one hour chunks and their head grower is having an hour long check in with a, a much more experienced head grower from a different farm every couple of weeks. So that's one way that somebody's spending it, but the, the farms are spending it in really different ways. And we've been quite we've been quite keen to let people do what they want with it. So we're, we're kind of. We're about six months in. Um, it's really slow. I think that's a bit of learning. I thought people would take up stuff much more quickly. People are really busy. So really the last from May, there's not been much activity and I've been sort of pushing people, but they've just been busy growing. So I guess that's some learning. Another thing is we've had these group sessions where we've brought, so we started with 10. We've actually got nine now because one of them had to drop out for various reasons but we had sort of imagined that bringing people together would be really useful and actually the feedback is that it's not that useful which is interesting we thought that sharing experiences as new CSAs would really help doesn't I mean we are continuing to do it but not as much as we'd envisaged it feels like the one-to-one -one stuff and the visits the visits to existing CSAs is really key and actually there's um the LWA Land Workers Alliance, which supports sort of all small farm, all small agroecological farms, not just CSA, so a lot of market gardens. They've run a mentoring program over the last three or four years, and they've had they had similar feedback actually that bringing people together in groups as mentees wasn't that useful. Um, so they've had really low attendance at their group meetings. Um, I think what else have we learned? We've put on these webinars. We've learned that we should charge people because we've had lots of people sign up and then not appear. And it's really annoying because we've limited the numbers um, to try and make sure that people can actually talk and ask questions. And then instead of 16 people, we've had five. And it feels like it's a resource that, must be, that is then wasted for other people that might have come. So we've started, we've just said four pounds, but I think, which is nothing really. But it, I mean, we've also, there's an option if you've got no money to not pay but we felt like it would be good to to ask people to put something to sort of have bought something so they might be less likely to not come and we've also as Sam kind of alluded to we've I mean this sort of came before the incubator program but we've done a, a sort of very basic form for our mentors where we've asked them what they're happy to mentor so what topics are they happy to mentor in so they might be agronomy topics or they might be kind of management topics but like and then we've asked them so some people have added in extra stuff so like they might be brilliant at facilitation or brilliant at I don't know health-based stuff so it just it means that uh, sometimes it's really obvious who would be a good mentor but otherwise other times it's not so it's really useful to be able to look down and go okay yeah they'd be really good on business plans and they also have the crop planning and they also have this so that's that's quite useful I think I think one thing we'd like to do is um, do some training for the mentors as a kind of obligatory thing, maybe once every couple of years, just like a morning, but, but mo mostly on kind of people skills and like how to do effective mentoring. Because some people, again, some people are brilliant mentors and others have an amazing amount of knowledge, but don't necessarily know how to pass it on. So it's just kind of trying to yeah, and I, I think I think that's some of the stuff I talked to you about, Sam, is that that urgency could support that work. Um, yeah, that's yeah. really great. I, I just wanted to hop in quickly to see if anyone else had any questions for Susie. Um, just wanted to welcome Abel as well from España. Thank you for joining us. Um, but yeah, I'll open the floor to anyone who has any questions for Susie before she has to yeah, I do need to go in a few minutes. Sorry. Um, I just had one question, Susie. Um, I know you said that um, farm mentees get a stipend um, to uh, visit other farms. Um, is there additional funding to compensate the mentor farms, um, or is the are the stipends 
um, given to mentees, also given to mentors? I wasn't sure about that. Yeah, so we, we so with the one day mentoring, we pay the mentor a fee for the day. Um, and then we pay, we don't pay the mentee, but we cover their travel. If, if sometimes when a mentee, so like on an existing CSA that's diversifying, they might actually want the mentor to visit them on their farm, in which case we'd pay the mentor the fee and also pay the mentor travel to the mentee's farm. Does that make sense? So basically the mentee doesn't get paid, but, the, but they get their travel covered if they have to travel and the mentor does get paid. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Alessandra, I think um, you wanted to... to yeah, try. yeah. I have not catch uh, uh, how you found, found you. Uh, so how you collect the, the money to do what you do. Um, in general or the mentoring? In general and or specifically on the mentoring, if the, uh, the people taking part uh, pays for uh, for the, let's say, service. So on the mentoring, the mentees pay £25, but that doesn't, I mean, a mentoring visit probably costs about £400, £350. It depends the travel costs, but the, the mentor gets paid 160 We've just upped our rates, but still feel like they're quite low. So the mentor gets paid £160 for a day. And then the travel can, I mean, is yeah, often 150 pounds if it's on the train. Um, so yeah, 300 to 400 pounds per visit. We charge the mentee 25 pounds. So obviously it doesn't cover costs um, generally. And, and so it's funding. I mean, our, our income is uh, about 10% um, um, membership fees from farms, uh, about 10% um, Donation, sponsorship, sales of T-shirts and things, um, and sales of our A to Z guide, and then about eighty percent funding from grant givers. So I don't know how it works in Italy, but I mean, in Spain they've been fundaciones, so like this, yeah, subventions. In Spanish it's subvención. I don't know what it is in Italy, but grants basically from from foundations that give out money to support work in our area which is not easy to get I mean and we, we yeah we're looking at so the I mean one of the things we're really actively exploring is a is the tithe system which is what um Genevieve from the C Canadian network does so they their member farms pay a membership fee to the network the national network but the members of the farm so each consumer as it were each customer pays $18 a year. I don't know what Canadian dollars are, but we just thought we have, fifth, we reckon we have about, uh, well, we, yeah, we have 50,000 people eating from CSA, which is about uh, 18,000 families. So we sort of estimate a family is three people. So even if those 18,000 families paid a pound a year, that would cover, pretty much cover salary of one of us. I mean, it would be a massive amount of money. If they paid five pounds a year, that would cover our entire annual budget. So it, we're looking at ways that we can get the farms to encourage their members to pay into the national network. But there's some resistance because it's, there's resistance because some farms think, well, if they give that money to the network, they won't give it to us. There's resistance because some farms think it's administratively a real pain. And there's resistance because uh, some farms think people don't really understand the national network or what it does, or, you know, it's going to confuse stuff. So, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Thank you. I am going to have to go. I don't know if anyone else got a la last question. Sorry. I Yeah. Yeah. Any final questions for Susie before she heads off into the sunset? <laughs> Darkness and rain. Yeah, into the into the gray darkness. <laughs> okay. Oh, cool. I, thank you, Susie, very Bye. much. Bye, sorry, I've got to go. Okay, take care, bye. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you, Lorenz, for joining us as well. It's nice to see you. Um, 
I think I will um, move on to Laura, if that's okay, to give a brief presentation of your organization, Noaya. And I'll share your PowerPoint if you'd like, yes? Yes, thanks. Hi, and, and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to the session. Really happy to be here. <laughs> of course, it would be nice to meet in person. Uh, I was lucky to be at the last uh, general meeting with urgency in Thessaloniki. I was there as part of the Mediterranean network uh, uh, that urgency created in collaboration with Terry Humanism. And actually, the, um, the term that we were using more in our network was LSPA, so Local Solidarity Partnerships for Agroecology. And the idea being that a CSA could also help farmers, small scale farmers transition towards agroecology. And so Terre Humanisme and Urgency had kind of created this, this new term um, together. And we met as a network, uh, as the Mediterranean network, because we have a lot of similar ecologies and challenges and, and foods. Obviously, you've heard surely of the Mediterranean diet, <laughs> well known for healthy food. Um, and yeah, very disorganized, very uh, separated the north and south shores of the Mediterranean. So it was very nice to be part of um, a network that we could work together on some common vision, which is also uh, something we'll be discussing as a group today. So I didn't really know what to call my presentation, but it's just really been um, something urgency opened my, my eyes to uh, a lot. And I was already seeing this in the fields when it, the field work that we do uh, with Nawaya, we're a local NGO in Egypt, um, is that we always talk about, well, if we want diversity on the plate, then we need to have diversity in the farm. And so it's kind of like this, you know, farm to fork or fork to farm kind of approach. But the fact that we have separated health and agriculture and that health is one thing and agriculture is one thing, is, is really crazy because we are what you know we eat. And at the policy level, nobody really pays attention to this. But at the end of the day, the supply chain and or the policies needed to secure um, you know, uh, work for small scale farmers. And at the same time that people eat healthy food, diversified food, fresh food, culturally appropriate food, I mean, let's define uh, nutritious food, that it seemed that nutrition was the easiest way to get as many people on board with what agroecology would be. You can stay on the first slide, actually. <laughs> Sorry. Apologies. <laughs> um, oh, it's OK, I, I will tell you. Um, but yeah, so same thing. You have a concept, agroecology. How do you, you know, have your elevator pitch? Or how do you explain that quickly um, in the communities where we work, which are rural, illiterate uh, commu communities? Um, it's kind of well, very, very academic terms and, and very difficult to bring them uh, on the ground and people are already struggling at the local level, so it's very difficult to even talk about these things. So it was more about stream, streamlining that and that's what nutrition was offering us. Um, Nawaya was founded in 2011, uh, right after the Egyptian revolution. Uh, the first year after the revolution was a very exciting time in Egypt. Um, energy and positivity <laughs> um, yeah just to do something so we got together with some colleagues even if we're from the city uh, we often would visit this rural area that I eventually moved to that is very close to Cairo and it just seemed crazy that in one of these closest rural areas to Cairo that there was no way to link with the farmers and even if there was a way to link with the farmers the quality of the produce or I mean the, the cheating that kind of happens uh, for example, a small scale farmer will spray pesticides on the crops that he sells in the market, but not on what him and his family eat. So like he knows what he's going to take home and uh, what the market gets. So that's the market's problem. So there, there is this kind of understanding, but there's also like I need to, you know, make money. So we uh, applied for a grant um, for a, a fund from a Swiss organization that uh, basically supported us to work with 15 families to start and kind of look at how we can you know, apply agroecological practices or have a discussion around it, uh, which was great. And actually it turns out very, very open uh, willingness to change and apply um, innovations or try doing things differently, even if it's on a small piece of the land. But when it came to, okay, well, we're gonna, we wanna eat these products or sell them or do something with it, we couldn't offer any solution. We were just two or three people that just 
wanted to connect with the lands around us and the farmers, and we really had no idea uh, what we were doing. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to start the presentation um, with this. You can go to the next slide. So as uh, somebody coming from the city and entering into a rural community, you're discovering agriculture, what's being planted, the seasons, uh, all the different dishes that people make that are um, very closely tied, tied to seasonal foods. For example, um, there is a type of pickle that we make in Egypt, but traditionally uh, the farmers would also eat the green stem of the pickle and a dish was made out of it. So recipes that are that are disappearing. And at the same time, um, this is a picture I took of like neck, literally like a piece of land, remote piece of land uh, in one of the furthest villages that we work in. That's kind of the rubbish that you find on, on the land, which is like chipsy and indomie, which is like this fast instant noodle um, that all the kids are kind of addicted to. So in working with the com these communities, they were trying to figure out how we can support them or work with them. Um, they're also uh, suffering from severe diet related diseases. A lot of um, the adults have diabetes and obesity and heart problems. I put these uh, numbers here because these are the um, World Health Organization numbers that they had in Egypt about of children and this is really like sad to see st like 20% of children in Egypt now ha have been in, in research categorized as stunted, which is kind of irreversible damage from poorly eating uh, from the time the mothers were pregnant and then the first five years of life. So, so that's one thing. And then we want to talk about agroecology and all the things about an agroecological food system, localized food system, fresh food system, diversified food system, um, protecting or preserving the local breeds and seeds, uh, promoting traditionally processed foods, and then the people that are living in, in the countryside, it's not about access or price at this point. This is like really a lot of ignorance about what you can eat or should eat or what, how you should have a diversified diet. So it was, it was quite shocking. And it was also seeing it that it was mainly with the young people in the villages. So the kids and the young mothers, uh, women get married very young in Egypt, sometimes 14. 16 is the average age, 17. So we're talking about really young girls that just don't know uh, much and are watching a lot of television and social media and are just, we have in, insane, uncontrolled corporate um, advertising in Egypt for all the food brands. And we have all the, the soft drinks and the chocolate milks and the, you know all the junk food kind of stuff. So it's, it's quite incredible. incredible. So uh, in the work that we've been doing now, we've kind of been, like I said, moving away from the farm to fork conversation. And what is it that we can do that from, from fork to farm and how um, we as people working in development, but also getting eaters or consumers, whether they're from the farming communities or the city have this conversation. Because these health numbers, by the way, are not just in the rural areas, like Egypt's health problems are across the board. So uh, if it's, you're talking about cities or high class or low, all of that, everyone has um, is suffering from a diet related disease. And we have some of the worst numbers in, in all of Africa, I mean, are coming from Egypt. Um, you can go to the next slides. Yeah, so I ironically, uh, a lot of the solutions for people's health problems are uh, held within the, the, grand, the grandparents, the elder generation. And also the area that we work with um, is a touristic area. We are an area south of Cairo. I'm sure you've heard of the Steppe Pyramids uh, or the Dachshur Pyramids. So it's, it's a very beautiful area close to Cairo. In half an hour, you can be downtown and then you can be by at the foot of the Steppe Pyramids. So it seems like, okay, well, if, if, all, if being eating healthy is about re rediscovering these old recipes and things that people used to eat and still know at this time, and at the same time, we have a nice area close to Cairo that can offer an income generation stream to kind of onboard people with this, um, because we need to have both, right? It's easy to just say, oh, we're going to do a, you know, a, a, a pro community project in this area because of its location, but we wanted to have people really on board 100% buy in. Um, so this was the, the idea, well, why don't we think about this concept of gastro tourism, 
which Italy is really well known for, Sandra, I'm sure, uh, that you can just travel around Italy and you can, there are areas where they have maps and you can find the local producers and really connect with um, the farming communities around. And at the same time, uh, thinking about, well, can this be something that can help us start a community supported agriculture model? Because there's already such a big gap between um, people in the city or people that are Egyptian or people like me who, you know, I'm still amazed at how many new recipes and foods continually we're discovering uh, across the country. We have a very rich um, agricultural history. And we've been influenced by so many different cultures throughout the years that there's just there's just so much there and we're just actually not not known for this at all. Um, so we thought, well, maybe this is where we can start and this would allow us to not only work with the women who have the recipes or that can do these products, but also their husbands and the farmers that um, are the men that are usually in charge of the land and also uh, finding a way to make this exciting for young people. Um, because we are close to Cairo, a lot of young people just prefer to, you know, drive a tuk-tuk or work in a cafe, shisha cafe or like find some sort of fast way of making money. Um, but tourism and this kind of stuff, it kind of, it kind of catches their attention. So this is kind of what we decided to work on right now is the, the, the fresh food. So working with the women farmers or the farmer families that we can directly um, support what they're like they're harvesting or like they're having kind of seasonal calendar that people can connect with these farmers around. Uh, people get really excited when they see zucchini for the first time with a flower on it or, or a cucumber. I mean, these are really small things, but like, yeah, most people don't even know if you haven't had a chance to have fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and also the, the processed foods, so things that women can do to generate income. And at the same time, it's something people are always excited to buy fresh bread or cheese or having kind of um, added value products. And, and that's great for the women because that gives them an income stream, whereas the farming is mainly controlled by men. Um, and then adding on to this and kind of having these exchange days where there can be a hand on hands on activity where we can highlight a certain product or its nutrition, always with a focus on nutrition, even if it's just simply fresh vegetables, you know, or a delicious salad. And at the same time, having these seasonal menus so that we can try and get people to come more often so that it's not just a one-time visit. And then working to kind of on at, at the kind of cross-cutting level, okay, we want, we all want to share these concepts. So in order to mainstream any of our concepts, I believe that we need to work with social media and especially video video because a lot of the women or communities we work with are illiterate so um, if we were to have anything written up I mean it needs to be spoken and that's how we're able to share um, certain values and concepts and also having the youth uh, learn how to run social media campaigns and actually deliver these kind of community screens. Um, yeah I think you can go to the next one. Uh, so yeah, because we depend on funding and uh, yeah, life is life. is life. Uh, sometimes we're active, sometimes we're not, but we've been very active in the past year, extremely active. And I just thought I would share some things uh, that we've been doing recently. So like I said, we're using nutrition videos. So I can share with you a link if you're interested where it's a peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. So we, we don't work with nutritionists saying things. We, it's more about filming women talk about their recipes and then uh, and the nutrition around them and then showing them in a community setting so the videos are not made for watching online and learning alone but really made for stimulating a group discussion and then reviewing the video and then brainstorming around it well how does it work if we want to eat more of these vegetables in our diet or encourage our children to have a healthier approach or yeah all the good parenting kind of things that we need to do um, and again, I really feel like if we don't do this, then I, I don't see how we can even start a conversation around, you know, community gardens or supported community supported agriculture. Um, what we have been doing a lot is the creative uh, process for the products and menu development. Um, for example, in Egypt, we grow a lot of cabbage, a lot. And women make something called mahshi, which is like a stuffed cabbage roll that, you know, you have in different parts of Europe as well. But they actually don't know, they don't have a single other recipe for cabbage. Like they, if you ask them, okay, well, do you have all this cabbage? And you do the same recipe with cabbage every Thursday. That's the routine of the week. But they don't actually know another recipe that they can cook cabbage with. 
blank. And we take it for granted maybe that, you know, we like to cook or we're, we're travelers or we like to try new things and we can go on YouTube or look something up. They have absolutely no access to new recipes. So once we had an Indian lady visiting us, she's an Ayurvedic um, practitioner, and she said, oh, just a really nice shredded cabbage, peas, and cumin recipe. It's a very simple recipe, totally using fresh ingredients from here that we, ha that we have. And that's just a really exciting thing that then if we can have eventually this kind of model that at least we're promoting, yeah, those, how, can, how we can eat these vegetables differently. Um, we've been, like I said, finding ways to engage uh, the youth. And when I say the youth, I mean young girls, some boys, but the girls are the ones that are more excited about this, uh, that have uh, smartphones now. Smartphones are really common uh, in the villages. So teaching them how to edit, make a short video on a specific product or a woman making a product uh, or a harvest. I mean, they're the ones that are in the fields that are able to kind of do this kind of storytelling and, um, and, and think of the things that are really going to engage other people around the seasons and, and farmers' life and, um, and eating healthy. And like I said, uh, we're trying to use gastro tourism as kind of a mechanism to engage people around nutrition. And at the same time, maybe build trust uh, with these people that are visiting, build trust of how things are made, about these women, their families, visiting their lands, uh, having a real exchange and trying to start a conversation around there or at least start to find the people that are interested in this because we feel very alone even as an organization like there's not another single organization in Egypt really working on any of these challenges so we've been really working hard to build a network and even when we do our pilot tours we always try and organ uh, invite other NGOs or organizations that we can kind of onboard with these values and, and concepts so it's been very interesting to see how receptive people are and how excited people are about these kinds of um, yeah, programs for, for small scale farmers. Um, definitely we're, what we call ourselves are more curators. We always put the, the women uh, at the, the front of, of these exchanges. And if we were to move towards some CSA model, we, we really wanna be in the background. And again, it sounds like simple things, but being able to speak and present yourself and, and feel proud as a farmer is very difficult though even the word you know peasant like we know in english it's not really a very positive word so it's it's very difficult to kind of yeah get get past those cultural barriers a lot of women are extremely shy they don't want to have their picture taken or or be visible or they're afraid of what their husbands will say some of their husbands don't want them to come to trainings i mean we're dealing with like heavy gender um, issues and sometimes it will take three years for it to click and then you know, one of the women that we've been working with, it took her three years to decide like, no, I, I want to be in the video and I want to show my knowledge and I should be proud of this and, and, and to stand up for, for what she's doing and not like feel ashamed of it and think, oh, well, I'm just, you know, a housewife or I, I have nothing to offer. Um, but on the contrary, she, she really does. Um, another thing that we're doing is, is trying to get people to work under this kind of common network or, or an umbrella. So being inspired by the values of slow food and of urgency, and also I'm part of an international network called Habitat International Coalition. So there's a lot of work in terms of food sovereignty and trying to yeah, explain that when we work together as a network, we also encourage, um, we also uh, stimulate more trust. So even when it's in gastro, uh, gastro tour, if somebody comes and sees one woman talk a specific way and then she's seeing another uh, woman in another governorate and they're all talking with the same values, there's kind of, um, it helps build the trust and, and that we are serious and that we all believe and we're passionate in what we do. And, and lastly, this is where uh, I'm very excited to work on uh, this is how do we yeah, link these local struggles to the global movements and be able to really talk about what we're doing and how important it is and this is not just you know we, we want to link to this and have an exchange and i would love that in you know two years that it's not me in this webinar it's one of these young girls that we're working with that's able to present and talk and and be connected to what's happening ar ar around because it is it really is this exchange that yeah keeps you going and yeah gives you hope that what you're doing is contributing to something something bigger so thank, that's my last slide. <laughs> I know I'm very, I'm not really a typical CSA uh, model, but um, yeah, thank you so much for listening to me and I look forward to any questions you have. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. That's really, 
inspiring. Um, it makes me nostalgic also. Um, I, um, I think that, you know, maybe there are a bunch of questions that maybe I'll just kick things off a little bit. Um, I think that you've had this really vibrant sort of trajectory from the revolution to sort of understanding and, and, and seeking out agroecological opportunities to ecotourism. Um, and I was kind of wondering what are some, what are some of the sort of significant moments that stick out to you in, in making these different sort of strategic moves within your organization? But sort of building on that um, and linking to your sort of last point about connecting to these uh, broader networks and things, what do you think are some of the largest challenges you're facing when it comes to creating CSAs or LSPAs in Egypt or a CSA network in Egypt? And how can some of these global allies help you with that? Um, yeah, so I'll answer the second question first. So you know, we all want to have some sort of legal umbrella or, you know, it's very hard to raise money in Egypt for anyone who doesn't know Egypt, maybe Sam that knows a bit, but the control over NGO work and civil society work is uh, uh, suffocating, to say the least. I mean, we waited three years for our fund to get approved. So yeah, it's very hard to make any plans. And then, yeah. Anyways, long story short, uh, we're very lucky to have um, met a local organization that was started by a group of lawyers and looking at how can we create stronger farmer cooperatives because we have farmers are completely disorganized and informal in Egypt because there is no legal framework that protects cooperatives basically so there is no point to create a farmer cooperative so um, one route is to either create an NGO which that has its own complications uh, the other route is um, to be in the private sector, which, you know, would put a lot of alarm bells off for a lot of people working on membership and community stuff. But in Egypt, it's our only avenue, really, that we can work more freely and fast and without having the risk of being shut down by the government. Um, so uh, La Via Campesina had trained a group of um, people, of which one Egyptian man who was trying to take, you know, how we can have cooperative type government governance and kind of like collective work under the legal umbrella of a company. So I know it sounds weird, but this is what we're going to be exploring together so that we can set up some sort of structure that makes sense because there's no point in putting a system together and then it collapsing, right? Uh, very risky under the cooperative or NGO law. So it is a maze in terms of the legal thing, but maybe we have to compromise and find other ways around that and then maybe advocate that if we have companies that are set up by farmers or farmers women that we can advocate for different kinds of taxes or you know that just go another di another way um, rather than like always be swimming against the, the current in Egypt so so yeah I think that's um, that would be something we have to consider yeah. great thank you I may um, Laura what, what, what's the what's the way for those farmers today to make a living right so prior to any um, um lspa or csa kind of model i mean how, how do they survive day to day um so we're kind of where where you're picking them up to try to tell them what it is that they could be doing so how does it work today well uh, just to be clear we don't have a csa model at all <laughs> like i don't want to uh, pretend that we do uh, i don't even know how to start that conversation at this point. So I've had the conversation informally with the farmers I've worked with, you know, over 10 years, you build, you know, you, you talk and it's very theoretical, but if you are not going to buy his entire harvest or protect that, we're too small of a, of a network. And um, in Egypt, we have uh, a lot of the organic or clean farming projects are in the desert. So if you see Egypt on a map, um, you have like this Nile Valley that's very narrow, and then you have all these reclaimed uh, lands that the government invests in, investors, all the big, you know, fantasy brands are there and they basically are using fossil water, which is extremely unsustainable and, you know, organic and exports and all of that. So people actually that want to pay go for that. And then the local community itself, like I said, they have some uh, foods that they will buy locally and then the rest is, is on the market. So I, I would imagine and I I don't know, maybe this is a question to those who, who are active in CSAs that um, 
because these lands are so small in Egypt, we need to get a bunch of farmers together in, in a very close geographical zone. Like our, a piece of land in Egypt can be six meters wide and 300 meters long, right? So you have your irrigation canal and your drainage canal. And then, so if you don't want to spray pesticides and your neighbor spraying pesticides, forget it. Like you're going to be the place for all the pests to come. So we have the problem of scale, the fragmentation of land. And how, you know, if we really wanted to get this model going, I would need to tell this group of farmers, okay, we're going to consolidate at least 10, 20 acres or something and figure out the water quality of filtration systems. So all of that gets extremely costly. And we're a really tiny organization. Like there's just, maybe it can come to that, but I, we're really just kind of going all the way around and being like nutrition, food, uh, getting people on board, talking about their children. It's a place where we can really have a deeper conversation about this I, I would really like to communicate better how food and, and, and like, yeah, um, health and agriculture can't be separate and like really have a, a deeper discussion with the farmers. We're not just doing like tourism to say, oh, look at this bread in Egypt that we've been making for 3000 years. That's not what we're, what we're trying to do. We want to talk about the whole wheat, the flour, the, the yeast that was used, uh, comparing it to commercial bread. Like people come and have an experience and a conversation around, around that. Um, hoping to then offer farmers, yeah, a CSA something, <laughs> but yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe one, one more. Uh, are there any historical precedents on how um, Egypt farmers um, used to do things differently in the past, or has it all been wiped away by neoliberalism? I mean, is, is there anything that you, you can, or, or they can build on, right, based on, on historical, um, um, experiences and, and, and um, uh, models. So unfortunately, we had the high dam that was built in the 50s um, in Upper Egypt, and that was kind of like the cutting of the wrist, you know, <laughs> of the country because it's an absolute disaster because before we had a cycle, we had floods, we had silt, very, very, very fertile silt that was coming through the Nile floods. Uh, now the silt is accumulating behind the high dam to the point that like international companies are coming and making assessments of how they can like extract this because it's extremely valuable and the silt is like filling the dam up so fast that the entire Lake Nasser dam will be completely filled with silt in 250 years that was the latest, latest assessment so I have no idea what the country's gonna do but like it's been the worst decision ever and recently, uh, in meetings with different NGOs in Upper Egypt, it's becoming a public com topic of conversation, especially with the, um, the dam that's been built in Ethiopia and all the water pressures that we're under. Uh, our president has like announced that he wants the whole country to convert to drip irrigation in eight years. I mean, these are big, big things to say, right, for a country like Egypt. So on that side, in terms of like what used to happen and what's happening today, there's that element. And then there's the element that is kind of global at this point, is that the privatization of land. This is a very new concept for a lot of places around the world. It doesn't make any sense if you really think about it. So, so yeah, and it's not only the privatization, but it's this tiny, tiny fragmentation, uh, you know, where we have like a quarter of an acre and people have pieces of land that are that small. So. So a lot of it comes down to, yeah, this consol consolidating the land because it's important for like organic or like agroecological practices. But at the same time, it's a bit of a trap because it's also what the government wants so that they can implement kind of commercial contract farming. So it's a very thin balance of where the country can go, being extremely strategically placed for export to Europe and having like kind of perfect weather for that. So, so yeah, there's a lot of like that in the background. Um, but yeah, the ancient Egyptians, it was a completely different, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. If nobody's asking questions, I have one more maybe. Um, you were just talking about the privatization of land um, starting to happen, right? Um, what does that mean for current farmers? I mean, do they own the land or who owns the land or doesn't matter who owns the land because it's just something that was um, just is the way it has always been? How, how does that work? Uh, yeah, so there, there, that was after the revolution in the 50s, there was a redistribution of land, and then certain families owned the land, and then after several generations, each, you know, succession, somebody uh, gets a little piece and a little piece and a little piece to the point where the next generation, I mean, something's got to change because it's getting too small to, to, do, to do anything, so I think 
it will come automatically from people. Maybe a solution needs to be offered. And a lot of people that inherit land don't even want to be farmers. They're maybe the older brother or they don't really care at all. You know? so, so a lot of land is rented because there's a lot of landless farmers. And, um, and yeah, I mean, when I say a new thing or privatization, yes, it's always been private. But at least when they had the big landlords that own the big pieces of land, there was something called a crop rotation. And all the older farmers that I talk to that are in their 80s say, oh, we missed the crop rotation. Because at that time, the government would say, you're planting now fava beet. Next season, you're you know, planting this and that. And so they kind of, in a strange sense, kind of want this rotation to come back. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions for Laura? Just want to welcome uh, Elska as well, who's joined us and will be giving us a brief presentation a little bit later. So welcome. If not, um, maybe we can move on to Kate and Striker. Is that? I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Is that right? Yep, at least that's how we pronounce it in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kate. Not in Austria, though. That's where my <laughs> grandpa is from. I'll, I'll keep it to myself. <laughs> Friends learn to help up with, the, with the correct pronunciation, I'm sure. <laughs> um, Kate, if you would like, I can share your presentation. Okay. That's perfect. Thank you, Sam. Great. Well, hi everyone. Um, I've been researching a little bit about the global history of CSA models for about the past year, um, but I'm going to actually start by giving a little bit of an introduction um, on the organizations that I work with. Um, so as Sam said, my name is Kate Ann Stryker. Um, I live in the Hudson Valley region of New York State um, in America. So we're about an hour and a half north of New York City um, and consequently have um, a very large farming community here. Um, many farms who sell with just within the Hudson Valley, but also many that sort of build the food shed of uh, the greater New York City area. And I work for an organization called the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming. Um, we've been around for about 20 years, a little bit more than 20 years. And our primary mission is to ensure that our region remains one that is defined by food and farming, um, where the next generation of farmers are equipped with the tools they need and the education they need to use regenerative practices uh, and where there's greater food justice and food sovereignty um, in our communities as well. And um, some of the forces that we're fighting against <laughs> include capitalism, um, lack of sufficient benefits in the United States uh, for people to access good food, um, and also things like housing. Housing is very expensive here, um, too expensive for many farmers and farm workers to afford. Um, uh, farms aren't able to provide sufficient uh, salaries to their farm labor. Um, and also, since we have a lot of gaps in our healthcare coverage, um, that's a big concern for farmers. And the value of land here is very high, too, uh, especially during the pandemic when a lot of people left New York City to buy property in the Hudson Valley to sort of escape this urban pandemic. Um, so uh, Glenwood has a lot of work ahead of us, um, but we, we work on uh, various, various things, um, a lot of coalition building among food and farming experts in the region. Um, but why I'm here today is because in 2016, we founded what is called the Hudson Valley CSA Coalition which is a group of about 120 farms all within just the Hudson Valley region um, that use the CSA model. Um, and the coalition was formed um, by request from farms for a need for more collective marketing 
for education of consumers, many of whom had never heard of CSA. Um, but once they learned what it was, they were very interested in the model. Um, and also a lot of farms were interested in increasing the access of their CSA, um, especially to Americans who receive um, SNAP, which was formerly known as food stamps or federal benefits to purchase food. Um, but there's a, there's a bit of a bottleneck um, in that our benefits are distributed usually on a monthly or weekly basis and you have to receive the food upon purchase. And so the upfront payment model of CSA is very difficult, if not impossible, for people who are relying upon federal benefits to buy food. Um, so I work a lot with the Hudson Valley CSA Coalition. We have um, a link that Sam put in the chat box. Um, one of the biggest things we did was create a website, um, a directory where people can search for different CSAs. Um, they can put what county they live in, what sort of share type they're looking for, um, and find farms accordingly, which has been very successful. Um, and the Hudson Valley CSA Coalition is also involved in the CSA Innovation Network. Um, I can also provide a link in the chat box to that, um, which is a national network of CSA coalitions of technical assistance providers who are all trying to do uh, similar work in the United States to increase the accessibility of CSA, um, to integrate CSA with healthcare models around the country, um, and to make sure that our farmers have as much support as they need and that consumers have the support that they need as well, whether it's translation or subsidies um, or just education on the term um, so that they can enjoy CSA as much as possible. Um, but you can go to the next slide, Sam. Um, so when the CSA Innovation Network um, was doing some work on an equity statement last year, we decided it was really important to do a little bit more research on the global history of, of CSA um, and to see where credit has been largely given, um, where credit is overdue, and not just look at the global history, but also really dive deep into the history of CSA in the United States. Um, and that's what I'm talking about briefly today. Um, so I thought I'd begin just by framing why history matters so much to us. Um, a key element in fighting for food sovereignty is to tell the whole story, to revisit the histories we have learned, um, many of which are written with a very colonial white supremacist lens, and to delve deeper, elevating the voices and perspectives of historically marginalized communities. Uh, to this end, the CSA Innovation Network has explored the history of CSA in the United States and globally, observing where credit has been given and where credit is long overdue. Uh, and I just wanted to say that by no means is this a comprehensive history. I'm sure that there are stories left untold, um, but we hope that this gives you a new vantage point from which to understand the system we all participate in. Um, and I think it's also very relevant to the theme of the Urgency uh, Symposium this year. You can go to the next slide, Sam. All right, so I know that this is a big timeline and I'll try to talk fast and uh, apologies in advance if I mispronounce any, anything here. So the dawn of CSA in the United States is most commonly attributed to Indian Lion CSA and Temple Wilton Community Farm, both of which were founded in 1986. While these farms have played undeniably large roles in the popularization of CSA, they're not in the first in the US to have thought of the model, nor is Europe the first place in the world to have established agricultural memberships. Booker T. Watley, a black author, horticulturist, and a professor at Tuskegee University, identified 10 commandments he considered essential for successful farming in the 1960s and 70s. Included was a concept of a client tell membership club in which members paid an upfront fee to pick their own produce 
all season long. Now considered two separate farming models, CSA and Pick Your Own are foundational to many farms in our country and around the world and are only becoming more popular as demand for fresh local food grows. As Watley was conducting research on intensive small-scale farming in the United States, CSA-like models were being independently established elsewhere in the world. In 1965, a group of Japanese women founded the Teike system. Teike built off of Japan's long history of economic cooperatives. It also reflected growing national concern over food safety and chemical contamination in the wake of Minamata disease and gained additional momentum after the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown of 1986. Farming cooperatives remain very popular in Japan and the Japan Organic Agricultural Association elevates consumers and producers shared commitment to safe, healthy food. Cooperative farm models began to take hold in Europe in the 1960s as well. Inspired by philosopher Rudolf Steiner's teaching on non-chemical agriculture and associative economics, Germans Carlo Guslos and Togger and Hans Groh established a community land trust, Gemeinnützige Landbau Forschung Gesellschaft, in 1968. The land trust proposed a model that they called agriculturally cooperating community, in which non-farming community members granted loans to farmers. In Geneva, Switzerland, farmers inspired by the collective agriculture in Chile during the Allende administration founded a producer-consumer alliance called Les Jardins de Cucagne in 1978. By the 1980s, there were proto-CSAs developing across Germany and Switzerland. CSA traveled from Europe to the United States via Jan van der Tween, a Swiss biodynamic farmer, and Trogger Kro. Temple Wilton Farm was founded by Kro, Anthony Graham, and Lincoln Geiger in 1968. That same year, van der Tween introduced the idea to Robin van En, who founded Indian Line Farm and ultimately popularized the term community supported agriculture. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Urgency Honorary President. Elizabeth Henderson, who founded Peacework Farm in 1989 and has been using the sliding scale CSA payment model for a very long time. Um, since then, the CSA model has continued to flourish throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, um, first in the US and Europe and ultimately across the globe. CSA goes by many names around the world and has no one founder. But universally, I think we can agree that the model prioritizes financial security and viability for farmers, robust and healthy soils, and safe chemical-free food for community members. As CSA continues to gain momentum, I think we must decolonize its history and celebrate the many thinkers who saw the benefit of cooperative economics and producer-consumer mutualisms. This paired with a commitment to making CSA accessible to all members of our communities who want one will bring us one step or step closer to food sovereignty. Um, so that's all I have prepared. Here are some of the sources that uh, we use for our research on the history of CSA. Um, but I'd love to open it up to questions either about the research or more about the CSA Innovation Network, the Hudson Valley CSA Coalition or Glenwood. Thank you, Kate. That was great. Um, I have some questions, but I think I'd rather just open it up to the floor um, and uh, let others sort of get involved and ask questions or share their ideas or comments on Kate's lovely presentation. So I'll leave it to the floor. I've shared most of the links I could in the chat, Kate, just to help support your presentation. I don't want to be first again, so if anybody else wants to go first. <laughs> okay, uh, one question, Kate. Um, you mentioned early on that the um, SNAP program is not quite compatible with the prepayment model of, um, of um, the CSA. Does that mean that you have exclusively a prepay model where you pay for the entire season in advance? Because the reason I'm asking is that with, with us, it's, it's actually to the, to the consumer, if you will, the harvest chair, as we call them, whether they pay um, for the entire season in advance or whether they pay by month. 
-hmm. And because so many people pay in advance, it's not a problem from the cash flow, right? And that would be compatible with the SNAP model. But am I right in assuming that everybody pays up front, which, which kind of limits the, sorry, yeah, get a follow-up question if the answer is yes, so. <laughs> oh, um, so it, the, the long answer is that it depends. There are definitely many different iterations of the CSA financial model, depending on which farm uh, is selling the share. So there are some farms that are very strict in terms of the upfront payment, but many nowadays are more accommodating. Like they still want a majority of that money to be upfront, um, but in order to make their shares more financially accessible for more people, they will often um, allow for payment plans, usually like what you were saying, um, on a monthly basis or maybe in four installments over the course of the season. Um, so SNAP is a bit different in that it really, it does require you to pay every time you're picking up a share. Um, it makes it very difficult to pay at all in advance. And um, there's some stigma around it because you need special equipment to swipe people's SNAP cards or EBT cards. Um, and the, that equipment is very glitchy um, and also very expensive for individual farmers to obtain. It's like a total headache. Um, and you would think by now that the government would have um, been more accommodating of small scale farmers and allowed for you know, online processing of SNAP benefits, but we still have a very long ways to go. Okay. I have a follow up, but unless somebody else wants to go first. You can go for it. No, because the reason I'm asking this is because um, um, we are trying hard to actually um, be consciously open to low income people, right? Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things that seems to be fairly prevalent in the German speaking countries is that there is no fixed price, right? But you, you contribute what you can, right? As long as the overall money comes into um, to pay for um, for the production, right? But um, so so we are constantly trying to deviate by allowing people to pay less, right? And and certainly allow them to um, pay in a monthly installment. But um, the and it's, it still is hard to actually get people to um, to um, join the CSA, even if you invite them to pay less, right? Because it's a question of pride, right? And kind of um, so it, it, show, it turns out that about. Um, about two thirds of the people um, or, or half of the people pay exactly the average that we're asking and 25% um, um, pay more and 25% pay less, right? But there's very few people that, um, that will go to the bottom of that. But you seem to have an even stronger issue with that, right? Um, that um, um, including lower income people um, um, is even harder um, in, in that setup. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it can be really challenging. Um, I've been at a couple CSA distributions where most people are just picking up their share. Um, and then there are members who right, are trying to swipe their card with the EVT reader and it's not working and you have to try it over and over again. And it's just, it's mortifying um, for everyone involved. Um, so that is definitely a challenge. Um, we do have, I mean, a lot of uh, CSA farms in the coalition who are still unable to accept SNAP have found other ways to provide shares um, for people who need some sort of subsidy. And those can come with less stigma, um, such as right, self-identified sliding scales, um, where people, they don't necessarily have to tell the farm their income, but the farm may send out a list of like, income brackets and what like based on your income bracket and how many kids you have here's what we think you should be paying for this food um, and that allows people a pretty good honor system um, and people are by and large very honest about what they are able to pay um, some other models i've seen um, are just yeah discounts um, based on request working shares or barter share where people will volunteer for several hours um, a week or maybe just several hours over the course of the season depending on how big a subsidy they need. Um, and there are a lot of 
farms as well who, if they have leftover shares at the end of a distribution, will donate it. Um, and that's a different thing. I mean, there's there's a question of dignity there as well, um, where some people, um, regardless of how little income they have, they really want to pay something for the food that they're getting. Um, and so that is a great opportunity um, for, yeah, for CSA farms to, to try to make a, a better food access model. Um, but then of course there are people who can't and we still want people, those people to have access to food. So it's nice to see so many farms donating so much, so much produce as well. Oh, and I should mention too, sorry. Um, one more thing that some farms do is um, they have income brackets, but also then um, they may have like an opt-in as you're checking out. Like, do you want to donate $25 or $50 to our like solidarity share program um, so that either you can, you know, a different member can access a share who otherwise wouldn't be able. Um, and that has been very successful, especially in um, more affluent areas where there are uh, there are members who fall so high on the income category that they could probably pay three times as much as the farm is asking. And they should. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Great. Come on, guys, if you don't stop me, I got to keep asking questions, right? So uh, <laughs> yes, we need we need we need to ask uh, one more. <laughs> Well, let's let's see if there are anyone else. If there's okay. anyone else. in fact, I mean, Elska, I know, um, is working with a, a model, a sliding scale kind of model. Maybe you wanted to contribute a little bit to the discussion about maybe the successes or the challenges in your particular um, model. Yes, that's fine. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, how is everyone doing? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, thanks for um, for the talks. I just come back from the farm, so I, I uh, couldn't uh, join the whole session. But um, I heard a bit uh, some stories, and it's very interesting to see that you guys are all working a bit on the same topics as we here do, and that's that's nice to hear. Um, so uh, I am uh, I'm Elske, and I'm a peasant farmer in uh, in the Netherlands on a one hectare uh, CSA agroecological CSA. And we have uh, 90 um, uh, veggie bags every week in the season. Uh, and we are actually, um, yeah, struggling also a little bit with this. Uh, we, are, we were earning half of the minimum wage um, and we wanted to increase the price to get a, a minimum wage at least so we can pay um, also insurance and uh, retirement, etc. Um, but still, we didn't want to exclude people. Um, I am actually part of the group who is uh, with a very low income, so it would be weird if I say that, you know, those kind of people are not uh, welcome anymore to, to have local agroecological food. So uh, we were looking for a way, what can we do to get a fair income for us producers and still have it inclusive for everyone. Um, and I started to talk with other uh, colleagues of mine uh, in the Netherlands, in Belgium and Germany uh, about different ways how we can uh, get a fair income. And one of the things is, for example, indeed the, the sliding scale where people can decide that there's not a fixed price. Another really nice initiative is from, uh, is in Germany, very popular, it's called Bitterunde. So it's like an auction kind of. So the farmer is very transparent about his own hours and he calculates his own wage already. Uh, all the costs and then people can do a, a bidding um, and that's uh, yeah um, also not checked or something so then you don't feel awkward about your income um, and we started a new concept here in the farm uh, in Omur the town where I work and it's called we called it a solidarity payment um, and what we do is we used to have a price on our veggie bag, but now we give our veggie bag. It's for free. So it's a gift from us to the, to the, to the members, the shareholders. Um, but what we do want is the cost uh, that belong to sustainable production. We want that covered and we want a fair income. 
Um, so no profit, but cost covered and a fair income. And in order to do that, we are transparent. So we tell the people how much it costs to make one veggie bag, and we say how much time it costs to make it. Because people are so disconnected from food, they have no idea anymore how much work it actually is. So it's not just harvesting, but it's also in the winter, doing the administration, ordering everything, putting the compost, uh, planting, a lot of weeding, the irrigation, harvesting, washing, uh, weighing, making the bags, all that together, we say uh, it takes us one hour. And then we have smaller bags, bigger family bags, and that changes um, the time that we work. But uh, the average time is, is one hour. Um, so then I ask to the shareholder, what is the wage that you want to give to me? So this is another way of um, yeah, thinking about food. So I don't anymore sell my food, but I'm kind of selling my working hours. And this works really good because um, yeah, people can say uh, to an onion, ah, oh, you, uh, you're not worth it. But people don't say to another person, ah, oh, you're not worth having a minimum wage, right? So it's a really different way of thinking. Um, and it, yeah, that works really, really well. Um, and the nice thing is that people really start to see the value of a product um, and they can all contribute. So we also say we also say to them, like, what's the weight you want to give to us? And please let that be uh, a little bit like your own um, income. So uh, everyone can pay according to their own income. Uh, we also we are also so we're transparent about the costs, about the time, and also about what is the minimum wage for a freelance person in this country. Because a lot of people are working for a company and they see the the net income, and they don't know that a freelancer has to also pay the tax, the insurance, the retirement, etc. So we are also transparent about that, so people understand more that we also have more costs to pay than uh, if you are uh, working for a company. Um, and then, yeah, then we leave it free so people can pay us one euro, 100 euro, it doesn't matter, there's no minimum, no maximum, it's totally up to them, and they can decide our wage, uh, and depending on that, um, we calculate the price, and uh, that's what they pay, and they pay it up front in the beginning of the year, um, and if people have really problems with that, then we're open to discuss and to see a solution so they can pay in, a, in, in terms, for example. And another really nice thing that is happening here is that we have in, in the province of Utrecht, in the municipality there, they have a, a kind of card for people with a very low income. It's called UPAS. Um, and um, with that card, you can, for example, I think it's like 350 euro budget a year. And then there is a list of initiatives that you can join, for example, swimming class or theater or sports or something. And now uh, one of the initiatives that's also on this card is a, is a CSA membership. So then a person with a low income gets around 350 euro discount if you would use it all for one thing uh, to become a member. So it's really nice that municipalities are now also uh, supporting it in that way. Um, yeah, that's, that's really shortly um, uh, what is the uh, initiative that uh, we have. And actually, it's working uh, really, really well. So our price has almost doubled uh, the income that we get. So that's really, really good in one year. And um, I wrote a little book about it where I, um, uh, it's called Eerlijk Loan in Dutch. And I, I collected the different uh, initiatives from farmers um, very practically what you can do in order to um, yeah, get a fairer income. Um, and also now, producers outside of agriculture are starting to use this model. So I have a friend, for example, for example, she's a carpenter and she says, yeah, everyone has the prices of Ikea uh, furniture in their minds, but it costs me, of course, so much hours to make a, a table, for example, and people don't understand anymore that value. So she's now also using um, the transparency of the cost and the, the hours it takes to make something and then asking the people what is the weight you want to give. Um, and I think it's very beautiful and needed for sustainable production um, that we uh, do this. So, uh, yeah. That's surely the thing I wanted to say, Sam. <laughs> Wonderful. 
Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, that's, I mean, it's great to hear about the model itself, but it's also wonderful to hear that it's been so successful that you've been able to um, double, you said, is that right? Almost, yeah. Yeah, we went from average 10 euro for a veggie bag for two people, and now it's uh, almost 18 euros on average, yeah. Fabulous, fabulous. Have you, have you noticed a change um, in the sort of conversation around the the shares as well i mean has this idea of the bidding round changed the way that people talk about it as well either in a you know in a positive or, or a challenging way yeah so the bidding round is a system they use in in germany uh, and we are using the the solidarity payment uh, how we call it with uh, asking for a wage but it um uh, the thing I really love is that people start to think again about um, the value of a product, in this case, food, and in, in the case of my friend, a table. Um, and it, I think it's a very strong message to say uh, we don't want profit. We don't want uh, to become rich. The only thing that we want is to have the costs covered that belong to sustainable production and a fair income, at least a minimum wage. That's the only thing we ask. And that's actually a very humble statement, I would say. And still, it's so difficult to get there for a lot of producers. Um, and this, this is starting to make people think like, ah, OK, if we put our euro into the supermarket that is promoting uh, highest quality for the lowest price, this actually means exploitation of the producers. right? So we need to really um, let go of, of uh, the money connected to food and start connecting it again to um, is this is this explo exploitation is that's why it's so cheap and then it's people start to rethink value and how important it is to pay a fair price. So yeah, I, I feel that there's people who are like okay uh, I just fill in the form and that's it goodbye, um, but there is also people who really say ah yeah indeed you have to do all these things and. Uh, I am actually earning uh, so many uh, money. Why are you earning below the minimum wage? That's actually weird, right? And then say, yeah, indeed, it's a bit weird. So maybe I can do something about it. Yeah. I don't know if there are any more questions or if people, maybe no initiatives like this in your countries. I don't know where everyone's from, but. Any other questions for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't have said so, but if you called me, right? <laughs> uh, put no, we, we are using, we're using Peter Runden um, in Austria as well, right? So we could, and we make it completely transparent, the cost or the salary for everybody active in the farm. So it's um, it's a different angle, but it's similar to what you just described, right? But so this this is one side, right? So we've opened it up on the side of um, of um, how much do you pay, how much do you contribute, right? Um, um, as a food share, right? as as a, as a consumer, right? But uh, we've also opened it up on the other side, and I'm curious to see what anybody else is doing that too, right? And what I mean by that is there is no longer um, um, a food bag or a vegetable bag, right? There is. Um, there's a market booth and um, you go there once a week and you take what you want and as much as you want. Right. So we, we, we call it, we call it free taking, free sharing, whatever. Right. So there's a booth and you take whatever you want and how much you want. Um, and as long as the group of people that does that is small enough, it actually works. Right. Um, and so there's kind of a social control between people that know each other. So nobody's just um, stuffing his bags um, um, beyond. And the other way it works is that I, I might not like a certain amount of vegetable, a certain type of vegetable, somebody else likes it. I might be in holiday this week, somebody else has guests, right? So it kind of averages out. Our experience is that if at least um, 40 sharers at one uh, market booth, it works out, right? Um, um, that's kind of the statistics that we have. But um, is, is that something anybody else um, is doing as well? Or are we on our own there um, with, um, with doing that? Because I, I must say that it works um, successfully for the last 10 years, right? Um, that, um, both opening it up on, on contributing what you can, but also on taking what you need. Um, um, so I'm just curious to see whether this is something that is um, Germanic, right? Um, or that is something that is happening elsewhere as well. Yeah, we we are personally in our farm using veggie bags. 
but we have a lot of a, a lot of CSAs in the Netherlands are um, pick your own. Uh, so it's with, with this system that you pay up front, you get access. Sometimes it's uh, like two days a week, but other farms, they are open 24 seven and people can just come anytime they want. Uh, and then they, they, yeah, they pick what they can. And then there's differentiation, for example, when there are uh, strawberries, then the farmer says uh, the rule is that you have to pick as much as you can eat freshly, kind of, and for your share. So you can't harvest many kilos and put it in the fridge. So there are certain rules. Um, and then there's different, uh, so they put a sign uh where when certain crops are ready to harvest and they have sometimes different colors for example okay take a little bit of this because we don't have a lot and then another other color says okay please uh, harvest as much as you can because there's way too much uh, and it has to go now so they differentiate uh, and communicate in that way so that's yeah a lot of CSAs in the Netherlands work with uh, with this system and I think it's very beautiful but we do see that that you need to be within around five kilometer um, your farm needs to be within five kilometers from the from the main group of people because people don't like to bike much further than that. So when when you are within a five kilometer, most of them are pick your own, and we are, for example, a bit further, and then we have veggie bags, uh, and that works better here. Yeah. I don't know if everyone, if other people also have this uh, pick your own system in your countries. I think Alessandra. Um would like to chime in. Now, may I add something to Lauren's uh, question? So uh, in my uh, scene, the CSA, I am member, um, we have also this uh, procedure. So we pay in advance, uh, uh, almost uh, something less than the amount we have spent the, the previous season. And then we take what we need and want uh, week by week, and and yeah, and in the, it depends on the product we we take uh, and then the quantity, of course. Uh, and so we uh, calculate how much we have spent week by week, and so in the in the end uh, we have almost <laughs> uh, always the same amount spent and uh, the quantity we have, yeah we have chosen to have. So I don't know if it is uh, what you mean, uh, Lawrence, but it seems to be quite similar. So, sounds like it, yes, thank you. I'm sort of mindful of the time here. Um, I don't wanna make sure that we can get to you, Alessandra. Um, so um, I believe that you are last presenter, certainly not least. Um, but I'm happy to share your presentation if you'd like me to. Yes? Okay. So if I could welcome, please, Alessandra to the floor, postdoc from the Free University of Bolzano. Is that right? Yes, it is. Wonderful. Take it away. Okay. So uh, today I want to present uh, this project, NUMAS project. Um, yeah, yes, uh, as I uh, said, I'm Alessandra Piccoli and I'm a postdoc researcher at the Fury University of Bolzano and I'm studying community supported agriculture and participatory um, guarantee system. And the next uh, slide. In this uh, uh, particular uh, project that uh, uh, is called the CSA Beyond the Emergency a New Agricultural Model for the Solidarity Economy that is very uh, connected to the um, uh, also the the speech of this uh, uh, afternoon uh, if you have attended it uh, it is a project founded by the fondazione finanza etica connected to uh, banca etica in italy and has uh, several partners uh, in particular uh, the main partner is arvaya the largest and uh, yeah, uh, let's say more ancient uh, CSA in Italy, even if uh, it is just eight years old. Uh, and then the Italian network of, is, of CSA, that is an, at, at the moment an informal network of the CSA as the CSA phenomena in Italy is very young and not so developed. 
In the moment, we count less than 20 uh, CSAs uh, in the whole uh, uh, nation, uh, in our whole country. And so, um, yeah, and then DEAFAL, that is also um, an association uh, strictly correct, uh, connected to urgency, and another association, Ortazzo, um, based here in Trentino. And uh, this project has the scientific support of my university, University of Bolzano, University of Pisa, and University of uh, Urbino. Uh, it has been uh, thought uh, to promote uh, social and solidarity economy, uh, especially in this time of uh, pandemic and post-pandemic, we, we hope <laughs> still to be in this phase. And, and so uh, we start from the assumption that social and solidarity economy uh, can uh, lead to our uh, economic and social well-being, our sustainability, resiliency, also uh, in case of uh, such shock uh, like uh, um, the, the pandemic. And so the project uh, aims in particular to understand, to, to uh, study the CSA in Italy and to support a diffusion of this model in our country. As, uh, in our country, as I said, uh, uh, it is not uh, really uh, largely uh, adopted in Italy. Uh, and yeah, the second, the no, third <laughs> slide, please. So um, this project has uh, three phases. Uh, the first one is a, a large research on economic, social, and political dimension of Italian CSA. We are mapping the, uh, the CSA. Uh, and uh, um, we have um, asked uh, to uh, each CSA to um, yeah, declare a, a very long uh, list of information about how they uh, manage the economic aspect. Uh, then the social, especially the interaction of, uh, um, of members and how they engage new members in the, in the CSA and also the political dimension. So the relationship with the territories, with the local authorities, uh, and uh, the understanding uh, uh, of the political role of the uh, organizations. Uh, similar question, no, more focus on uh, social and political dimension. We have also um, interviewed uh, participants of the, the, our CSA, so uh, 12 CSA has been involved. They are the, yeah, the most uh, structured or at least uh, those uh, um, having at least uh, uh, two years uh, of activities. Uh, this kind of uh, CSA have been uh, involved and we have had uh, collected uh, 129 questionnaires uh, from members and then uh, um, three focus group to understand this, uh, these dynamics. Then uh, we are supporting the, uh, the creation and the development of new CSA, four CSA, one in, uh, in Trentino in my region, one in Ravenna, uh, one in, uh, and then the other two in Piedmont. And for with this uh, uh, activity, we uh, try to do something like that member um, mentorship uh, uh, about that I've uh, spoken Susie at the beginning of this session. And finally, uh, in the next year, we will promote this, uh, the CSA model in our country, uh, especially with promotional events, uh, dissemination materials, uh, and uh, informative articles. And so this is uh, the, the project we are uh, carrying on. In this uh, moment, we are concluding the research phase uh, and uh, going on with the support of new CSA uh, development. So yeah, this is my presentation, not so long <laughs> as the other, but maybe we can discuss uh, uh, more in deep uh, this aspect because 
the, the results of the research are very uh, large. And so as uh, the request uh, from the uh, organization was to be very uh, coincise, I have not added any, um, uh, any detailed um, yeah, results, but we can discuss about this if you have specific question because the research is very in deep. We have, uh, uh, we have uh, asked to the coordinators of CSA to answer uh, 98 uh, questions about their uh, organization. So we have collected a, a very deep uh, um, information about our realities here in Italy. Thank you very much, Alessandra. That's, um, yeah, I mean, I think that what really jumps out at me is number one, the, the, you know, really small number of CSAs that exist in Italy. Um, and I, I think that at least I personally would be interested in some of the results, particularly as it pertains to the experience of CSA producers and perhaps what can be gleaned from that information in terms of how to then, I'm sure this kind of feeds into these other um, sort of segments of the research, the, the support of the development of new CSAs and the promotion of uh, the CSA model in the country. So I, I, if you could maybe shed a little light on what you've learned, at least maybe so far, from the results of these questionnaires, um, maybe in the context of why perhaps the CSA model has not yet really caught on. Yeah, we have to say that in Italy, uh, it is very diffuse, the model of the uh, purchasing group, solidarity purchasing group that sometimes is considered uh, like um, a CSA and it is very, very close to CSA, especially uh, to the, let's say, uh, Anglo-Saxon model of CSA. We tend to distinguish two kind of uh, CSA and in Italy it is very diffuse um, the the more cooperative one and with with this uh, I I mean that uh, uh, we have uh, CSA based on uh, uh, independent uh, um, enter enterprises so farms uh, with a group of consumers around that buys uh, regularly uh, the, the boxes and so on. And uh, on, on the other side, we have um, a more cooperative uh, model that is uh, also sometimes diffused in Germany. And uh, uh, it is the, the cooperatives uh, where the entrepreneurs are the consumers. So uh, cons a group of consumers establish a cooperative and then they, um, have, as employee, the, the, the farmers are employee of the cooperatives and the, the consumers uh, own the land or obtain the land in some, some way. Uh, and uh, yeah, and they pay exactly salaries to the farmers. And this is quite diffuse in Italy, um, uh, one third of the CSA in Italy and the biggest one are uh, this cooperative uh, this cooperative model, and uh, this is uh, uh, very interesting from the um, community uh, perspective because they are really really engaged. The, the consumers are really engaged in this uh, process because they have to um, accept all the risk. The entrepreneurial risk is uh, uh, totally on the on the members, the, the consumers, let's say. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it is, uh, I, I think it is just an hypothesis in this moment, but uh, I'm uh, deepening this aspect. Uh, I think that uh, it is um, quite limiting uh, the diffusion of the model because when a group of consumers or farmers uh, uh, knows this model and think that this is the real model of uh, CSA, this is quite a barrier because it is very, very um, demanding uh, uh, from the community, from the, the, the members, the, the, the participants uh, uh, 
to establish a cooperative to find the land to uh, find the, far the the farmers the peasants uh, working on their land and so this is quite uh, I think limiting yes and and also the fact that the, the biggest and more famous also CSA in Italy is Arvaya. It is this cooperative, this big cooperative. They propose, of course, uh, their experience. So they, they pass to, to the CSA uh, constitution. And this is, uh, yeah, I think that this, this is uh, quite uh, discouraging people to, to start new CSA. I hope to have under, uh, answered. Yes, thank you. Yeah, on the other end, I have to say that uh, more and more um, experiences are uh, are coming uh, to to light <laughs> in this moment. I, I have news uh, of almost ten new CSA uh, forming in this uh, in this last year or half a year, probably also. Uh, as Susie uh, told us uh, before, uh, because of the pandemic and this uh, understanding of the value of food uh, and the, the importance to, uh, to have access uh, to, to local food, uh, the, the, the problems of supply chain on a, a, local, uh, on a global level mm. during the pandemic and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we have just a few minutes. Are there anyone, are there any other sort of thoughts or comments on Alessandra's um, very interesting project or any closing thoughts? sharing here well if i say just one thing uh maybe and just a, an input also to urgency um i think uh, it, it has been said by uh, susie for sure and maybe also laura and elske um the access to land is a very big problem also in our uh you know in my region for sure Trentino, because we are on the alps so on the mountains and but also in other uh, parts of italy and in general, land uh, is a, a, a big, uh, uh, yeah, the access to land is a big problem to change things. And so I think that this is, this is a very urgent <laughs> topic. Quite, quite um, because it's so multidimensional as well, this the problem, the challenge of access to land, whether it's geographic as in the Alps or whether it's economic or, uh, rooted in speculation um, in you know in Eastern Europe, so it's yeah I agree I entirely agree that it's it's uh, you know one of these root causes. Any other closing thoughts for our lovely and and Alessandra I apologize we didn't have any um, interpretation help I'm not sure if you would have wanted that but um, we just. And our you know, resources are quite limited at the moment. Um, so thank you for <laughs> speaking in English with us all. If, that, um, if that's it, then I wanna thank our wonderful poster presenters, Alessandra and Laura and Kate and Elska, and then of course, uh, Susie who had to leave a little bit early. Um, I really appreciate this wonderful conversation we're having. It's as I said, I sort of expected us to end a little bit early, but we ended up going the full time. And um, you know, I think that speaks to the, the sort of richness of these, these different projects and these ideas, and of course, these people who are sharing them with us. So I wanna thank you all so very much for being here. Um, also, I let me just put this in the chat. There is, oh, where is it? Here it is. So we have a general survey that we're sending out throughout the symposium. So if you could just take a few moments either now or, or later to share your thoughts. Um, and there will be a, thank you, Laura. 
there will be a, um, a report, a follow-up report based on this workshop as well. And the recorded version will also go up on our Urgency TV YouTube page. So if you want to access the recording at any time in the future, you can find it there. So with that, I think we should close unless anyone wants to, um, to share anything as, as way of uh, a final closing. Wonderful. Okay, thank you all for being here. Thank you, our participants, Abel, and um, I believe Maria may be gone at this point, but I appreciate you all being here and I hope you have a good night. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.